And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Ryan Metzler. Hey everybody, we're here today with yet another edition of the Dice Tower, and this time we're taking a look at uh, Dr. Kinesia's Samurai. This is a game for two to four players. Um, it's an area control game. It's it's actually very good. It scales very well. Uh, it's good for people like kids 10 and up. And um, pretty much it's going to play in about 45 minutes. So you can get this down. You can get it played. You can have a great time. Um, and it's not too hard to learn. So why don't we take a look at what's inside the box? So the first thing you get is a nice full color rule book. You can see here, uh, it's, it's well laid out. You can see all the pieces indicated at the bottom, uh, a layout of the map. There's examples of play on the inside. It's very clear. Uh, it covers pretty much every scenario. I've never really had any problem interpreting this rule book, uh, and you can learn it from one good read through. It's a very simple game. There's not a whole lot to it. So this rule book, while short, fully covers pretty much everything that you're going to need to know about the rules. The next thing you get is this modular player board. You can see here that the board breaks apart. It's easier for storage. Uh, and this board is the layout for where you're going to play the game. Now the board scales from two to four players. This is the two player board. And along the board you can see different landmarks. You can see large cities. Um, you can see some somewhat smaller cities and then these little villages around the area marked with blue. Um, these are going to be where you're focusing on capturing pieces. But more importantly, let's take a look at how the board scales for two to four, for three and four players. You can see, additional to the two pieces that are already on the board, there are two more pieces, and when you expand the game, you're going to be adding these pieces. Uh, you'll add one piece for the three-player game, and you'll add both pieces for the four-player game to expand the map and make it larger and more diverse for more players. The scalability is a nice feature because it allows you to play with fewer or more players and for there not to be too little or too much space uh, for the amount of players that you have on a certain day. The central focus of the game is going to be these little black pieces. The first type is the hi-hat. As you can see, it's just a tall little triangle type thing. Um, and these are made out of what appears to be a nice plastic or uh, acrylic of some sort. Uh, and they're really very sturdy. They're very nice looking. They're, they give a great aesthetic to the game. Uh, the second type of piece is going to be the Buddhas. And the third are rice fields. Now these are going to be the central focus in the game and that these are the pieces that players are going to be trying to capture. These are going to be the central focus of what players are trying to capture throughout the game, the goal being to capture the most of any one type of these pieces. These pieces are going to be placed in the capital city of Edo, uh, in any of the smaller red cities, and throughout all of the small villages on the board. Here we have individual player pieces that there are set up for each of the four players. You can see here that these, uh, these pieces depict pictures of the three different types of capture pieces that you saw earlier. The rice fields, the hi-hats, and the buddhas. You can also see that they each have numbers on them and that there are three different types for each of the three different types of capture pieces. A four, a three, and a two. These are going to be placed around the cities that contain pieces in order to have influence on that piece in that city. For example, this piece would provide four influence on a rice that's in one city, village, or town. The objective is to get the most influence around a piece before the piece is completely surrounded. The player with the most influence around a piece when it's surrounded gets that piece. If there's a tie, no player will get that piece and it'll be set aside. Additionally, you can see there are five different samurai pieces. Samurais may influence any one of the three different types of capture pieces. So for example, this would provide three influence on any Buddhas, hi-hats, or rice fields that it surrounds. Finally, we have ship pieces with two, one, and one values apiece. These can be placed on the sea areas of the map or the ocean areas of the map and will provide two influence on any of the three capture pieces that they're around. Finally, there are three types of special pieces, the first being the Ronin. You can tell he's different from the Samurais as he's on a horse. This piece is worth one influence but may be placed in addition to other pieces that you play on the turn. The next type of special piece is the swap pieces piece. Now what this allows you to do is to change the position of any two of the capture pieces on the board. 
You may swap a rice patty for a Buddha, a Buddha for a hi-hat, a hi-hat for a rice patty, however you like, but you must make sure that no two same figures are in the same city at any point in time. The last special piece is the swap piece, which allows you to take a piece that you've already played off of the board and replace it with this piece. This allows you to get a great piece back into your hand. For example, if you want to take your four rice patty back after a rice patty has been captured, and now this is doing you no good, you could swap it with this piece and pull this back into your hand. An important thing to note is that there are two overall types of pieces. There are normal pieces, which include all of your numbered pieces, your samurais, and the swap piece. And then there are pieces that have Japanese symbols on them. I'm not sure if you can actually see them in the video, but there's small Japanese symbols at the bottom of these two special pieces and the three ship pieces. On your turn, you're usually allowed to play one piece. That is one piece that does not have the Japanese symbol on it. You may play any amount of pieces with the Japanese symbol, and in this manner, may get more influence onto the board in one turn, locking out an opponent. So here we have the board for a two-player game, and you can see here that I have this shield. Uh, this is to, pr uh, to protect the pieces that I capture and to, pr uh, to hide all of my own player pieces, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But first we're going to take a look at how the game is set up. So in a two-player game, there are seven of each type of symbol or each type of capture piece available, and players are going to take turns placing these on the board. The first thing is that one of each type gets placed in the capital city. Now, in alternating turns, players are going to place pieces into the cities so that no two pieces ever match in one place. So each player will be placing pieces here, and once the cities are full, they'll go through, and one piece will get placed on all of the villages. So you can place these here, and you'll see that the game kind of spreads out, and it'll be different every time. The pieces will be in different locations, which adds some nice variability. After the board is entirely set up, each player is going to look at their individual pieces. They'll be able to look at all 20 and choose five that they would like to have in their starting hand, placing them behind their player board. After that, they'll take the rest of them, shuffle them up, and game, the game will begin with the youngest player. So on my turn, I would be able to play one regular piece from behind my player sheet onto the board. For example, I could play this four rice piece, or four hi-hat piece, I'm sorry, onto the board in order to influence some hi-hats. For example, let's say I play it between the capital city of Edo and this village over here. This would allow me to influence both the hi-hat in Edo and the hi-hat in the village. Additionally, on my turn, I may play any amount of pieces with the Japanese symbol on it. For example, my ronin. The ronin, when played, influences any pieces that it touches as it's kind of a wild. So for example, in this case, it would influence both the hi-hat in this village, as well as the hi-hat, the Buddha, and the rice field in Edo. Once a city, village, or town has been surrounded, you'll take a look at the total values adding up for each type of piece in the center. In this case, we can see that green has four, five influence on the hi-hat, which is more than the amount of influence, which would be two, three influence that red has. So green would capture this piece and in a two-player game, place it in front of their player board. In a three or four-player game, this would go behind, or behind their player board so that the amount of pieces captured are secret. The other two pieces, the Buddha and the rice field, are actually controlled by red because red has four, five, six, seven influence for the Buddha, he will capture it, placing it in front of his player field. The rice patty, on the other hand, is captured by neither player, as each player has three influence on it. Two, three for green, and two, three for red. This piece is taken off the board and placed next to it as an indicator that it was not captured. So that's really the game in a nutshell. That's how you play. Uh, the game will end when either four pieces are not captured, meaning that people tie for the amount of capture points they have and they get set aside, or until all of one type of piece is captured. For example, all of the hi-hats are removed from the board. Now, when that happens, you're going to reveal what you've captured, or in the two-player game, you're going to compare what you've captured. Uh, and you're going to take a look and see who has the most of one type of piece. So, for example, who has the most of anything, uh, who has the most Buddhas, who has the most hi-hats, who has the most rice patties. Uh, if one person clearly has the most, so for example, let's say one person has seven rice patties and the next person only has five Buddhas, 
um, that person is the winner. Now, if there's a tie, it goes on down to the next type of piece uh, that you have the most of. Whoever has the most of that is the winner, and there's a tie for that. It keeps going and going until you get to the point where you take a look and nobody has the most of anything. Uh, in that case, you're going to go to who has the most captured pieces, and that person's going to be your winner. Now, what do I think of the game? I, I, I really actually think this is a great game. It's, it's very, very good. Uh, it's very simple. You can play it in a very short amount of time. It scales fantastically. Um, and it's, it's a really good, I'd call it probably a light to very, very low medium weight game. Uh, and you can get a lot of plays in. It changes every time. It's, it's very good. Um, if you're a, a introducing people to games and you're looking for a nice area control type-ish uh, game, or you just prefer lighter or me like media middleweight games, uh, this is a great game to pick up. I would suggest this to anybody who is a light Euro gamer. Thanks for joining us today. For more written, audio, and video reviews, as well as the number one board game podcast, check out the website at www.thedicetower.com. Until then, this is Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. Yeah.